Welcome back to EGM 702, Photogrammetry and Advanced Image Analysis. This is Week 1, Part 5, Acquisition Planning. So, we've learned a little bit about uh, photogrammetry. We've learned about scale and parallax. We've learned about the different steps for uh, making stereophotogrammetric measurements. We've learned about control points. So we're all ready to go out into the real world and acquire images. So what are the things that we need to do that? Well, the first thing that we need is a camera, and it should be suitable, which means that uh, we want a camera that is fit for whatever purpose we are uh, intending to do. So if we're trying to make really high resolution, accurate orthophotos, we might use a really expensive mapping camera like the one shown here. If we are mostly just interested in getting sort of generally accurate images, we might use something like a GoPro. And we can also get really good results with a camera that falls somewhere in between these two extremes. We also need a platform. So we need something to put the camera on to go out and take our photos. This might be a helicopter, if we have access to a helicopter. Um, if we're doing photogrammetric mapping surveys, we might use a mapping plane like the one shown here. More likely, we're going to use a drone like the one that you can see here, or an unmanned aerial vehicle, or a UAV. But we also need an acquisition plan. We need to figure out how we're going to acquire photos. We can't just go out into the field and start snapping pictures and hope that it'll all work out. So to start with, we'll look at how we might acquire a 3D object. And usually, if we have, if the object is small enough, we might have a little turntable that we set the image on. We have our camera set up on a tripod and we turn the object a little bit at a time, acquire the photos, and process from there. <clears throat> We're trying to get a full 360 degree view of the object. So uh, we want to make sure that we get as much of it as possible, and also that each of our different images have quite a bit of overlap, because that will help us with the processing steps. Uh, if we get multiple views of each side of the object, recognizing that the object might not actually have sides, we end up getting better results. But remember, the only way that we can actually get results is that the camera can actually see it. So if we have an object that has a lot of you know, small nooks and crevices, uh, we might need to change the setup in order to be able to see inside of those uh, inside of those areas. Okay, what we're mostly going to be concerned with for this course, though, is aerial photography or aerial photogrammetry, um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about planning our flights. So the thing that we need to remember is that we need to have images overlapping. They need to see the same thing, and we need to be able to make sure we, we need to be able to find the same object in multiple images. So, if this is our image geometry, our real world geometry, this is the coverage that this camera sees, and this is the image size that this camera camera sees. If we move it a little bit, we have some overlapping area shown here. And we also have a distance between our two camera positions, uh, which I've marked B here. So the ratio of B to H, so the, the ratio of the distance between the camera stations and the height uh, of the camera stations above the ground, is actually going to determine how accurate the DEM that we get is. Typically, we want a BH ratio between 0.6 and 0.9. This is what usually gives us our best results, with higher values uh, giving better results. So what that means is closer to 0.9 rather than 0.6. Um, 
when we have our images overlapping, you can see here we have our flight direction taking multiple images like this. We have a number of different ways of thinking about the overlap. The first is something called the along track overlap, and this is how much the images overlap in the direction of flight. If we have multiple passes, so if we're looking at a target like this and we go across it this way and we come back across this way, um, the, amount of, the amount of overlap that we have between our different images across the direction of flight is what's known as the cross-track overlap. Um, our camera positions are recorded here as red dots and you can see where our B is in relation to these camera centers and we also have the cross-track distance D between our different cameras. In order to do our flight planning we have some parameters that we need to know. The first of these is the focal length of the camera uh, F. We also need to know the size of the sensor or the size of the film. Uh, we also need to know what the scale is that we want to use. Now this can either be the scale uh, expressed as, for example, uh, one centimeter to one kilometer or something like that, or we can express this uh, in the ground sampling distance. The example that I'll show in a moment uses the scale, but you can do the same calculations uh, using your desired ground sampling distance, which remember is basically the pixel resolution on the ground. We also need to know the size and the average elevation of our survey area. We need to figure out how much overlap we want. Typically this is around 60% for a long track and about 30% or so for cross track um, overlap. But again, depending on the, uh, the goal of our survey, we might have different values in mind. We also need to know the aircraft speed. And I should note that there are a lot of different software packages that you can go find to actually do the flight planning. You usually don't have to do all of this yourself. We're going to run through an example here just so you get an idea of the different considerations that go into it. Um, but when you do this you know, on the job or in your own research, um, this is not something that you're going to need to do regularly. Okay, so um, what we're doing here is this worked example. So we have a study area that is 10 kilometers wide and 16 kilometers long, and it has an average elevation of 300 meters. Our camera has a focal length of 152.4 millimeters and has a 233 milli 230 millimeter film size. It doesn't really matter here if we're talking about a digital camera or a film camera. All of the calculations are going to be the same. The desired scale that we have is 1 to 25,000. So this would mean that one centimeter in our image it corresponds to 25,000 centimeters on the ground. Our overlap is going to be 60% and our side lap is going to be 30%. So remember this is the overlap in the along track direction or in the direction of flight. And this is the overlap across the direction of flight. So to start with, we're going to plan on north-south flight lines. And I'm going to leave it up to you to think about why that is. Uh, if you're not sure, uh, go ahead and post in the discussion forum and we can discuss it more there. So the flying height above sea level is going to be this variable h and that is given by our focal length divided by the scale plus the average height or the average height sorry the average height of our study area. So in this case we have 0.1524 meters for our focal length we have a scale of 1 over 25,000, we have an average height of 300 meters, and this comes out to a flying height of about 4,110 meters. So far so good. Uh, the next thing we want to figure out is how much ground coverage each of our images has, and that is just going to be the size of the image divided by the scale. So remember that the size of the image is 233. 
230 millimeters or 0.23 meters divided by our scale of 1 to 25,000 and that gives us a ground coverage a long track of 5,715 meters. The distance between the camera centers is then 1 minus the percent overlap multiplied by the ground coverage uh, in the long track. And I should note that we're assuming a square camera or a square film size here, so all of these are going to work out. If you have a camera that has, uh, if you have a camera that has a not square sensor, then this is going to change slightly. Um, so okay, so the distance between camera centers B is one minus the overlap times the ground coverage, which is one minus 0.6 times 5,750 which comes out to 2,300 meters. The time between exposures is then the distance between the camera centers divided by the aircraft speed. If we assume a standard uh, flight speed of 160 kilometers per hour, our 2,300 meter uh, distance between camera centers turns out to be 51.75 seconds. Now, Modern camera systems can probably handle a, um, a separation that is a fraction of a second. You may have to round up or down depending again on your system. In this case, we're going to round down, which now means that we have to recalculate the distance between our camera centers. So we're rounding down to 51 seconds, which gives us a new distance between camera centers of 2,267 meters. We have a number, we want to calculate the number of photos in each line. So again, we're planning on north-south flight lines, which means that the, um, which means that our number of photos is going to be the length of the line divided by the distance between the camera centers. And we're going to add two, one camera or one photo at the beginning of the line, one photo at the end of the line. So this comes out to 16,000 meters per line, because remember we're uh, doing north-south flight lines and we have a 16 kilometer long study area, divided by 2,267 meters per photo plus two, it gives us 9.1 photos per line. And of course we round up. We wanna make sure that we have full coverage, so we're going to round up for the number of photos. The distance between flight lines is just the one minus the side lap or the cross track overlap of the images multiplied by the distance between, or sorry, multiplied by the ground coverage per image. So one minus 0 0.3 times 5750 gives us 4,025 meters. So that's how much flight line spacing we have uh, for our survey. The number of flight lines that we're going to use is just the width of our study area divided by the distance between lines plus one. So we have 10,000 meters divided by 4,025 meters plus one, which gives us 3.48 lines. And again, we're going to round up to get four flight lines, which now means as well that we have to recalculate the distance between flight lines and we get a new value of 3,333 meters. Finally, the total number of photos that we're going to have is just the number of photos per line multiplied by the number of lines, which is 10 times 4, which is 40. So this is a lot of calculations, and like I said, we often are going to be using uh, specialized software to do all of these different calculations for us, but it is useful to be able to think about this and get some feel for the planning that goes into this. Okay, additional considerations that we might have, uh, instead of using scale, I mentioned that we might use the ground sampling distance, and the ground sampling distance can be calculated by the physical pixel size multiplied by the height, the flying height, divided by the focal length. So of course this means, this means that we need to know the physical pixel size and you can usually calculate this by taking the size of the sensor 
divided by the number of pixels in either the X or the Y direction. We also want to think about the cloud and weather conditions. Um, you know, depending on what our application is, we might want sunny conditions, cloudy conditions might be okay. Probably don't want to be doing this in a hurricane. So all things to keep in mind as you're planning your acquisitions. Uh, the time of year as well, if you're looking at processes that uh, are going to vary over the course of a year and you're looking at changes from year to year, you might want to make sure that you're coming back at the same time of year. Same thing with vegetation conditions. Uh, if you're looking at vegetation, you probably want to come back at the same time each year. If you're looking for, for example, just the ground uh, height or the ground location, you might look at uh, flying when you don't have leaves on the trees. All of these are things to think about. And then of also you want to think about the time of day that you're flying because the amount of sunlight might mean that you end up with more glare which makes it more difficult to use the photos that you acquire. So uh, in summary uh, in order to acquire images we need a camera, a platform, and a plan. We need to consider the ratio of the distance between images divided by the height of the uh, of the flight server of, of our flight. Um, we also need to think about the camera and survey parameters and also consider the purpose of the survey. So thinking about what it is that we're trying to do, all of that is going to tell us, or all of that is going to help us figure out the plan for acquiring our images. And again, specialized software will help uh, do most of the planning, but at least the purpose of the survey is something that you will have to do yourself. So uh, we have additional resources. Uh, the um, Lewis and Kiefer and Chipman chapter three again covers a lot of the different concepts that we're talking about, including the example that I worked out here. Uh, this paper uh, from Hasegawa et al. Uh, in 2000 looked at the accuracy of DEMs based on the BH ratio. Um, and then there's a couple of links here for um, finding different apps to help you plan your flights if that's something you're interested in um, as well as a, an actual tutorial for using one of those software uh, packages. Okay so that's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting and if you, uh, if you have any questions please post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks, bye.